It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to talk about the 2018 cholesterol guidelines and what they mean for low carb, high fat. So first, get the clicker working, Brett. There we go. So the disclosures, no financial ties to pharmaceutical, diagnostic, or medical device companies, no compensation from food industry. I do get book royalties. I have an online health coaching business, and I host the Diet Doctor podcast and contribute to their online content. But first, let's start with the definition of irony. Trust me, this will make sense in a second. A state of affairs or an event that seems deliberately contrary to what one expects and is often amusing as a result. Or, maybe more pertinent for this crowd here today, presenting a medical guideline-based talk to a group of low-carb enthusiasts. I mean, because let's be honest, we're here in this room because we realize the guidelines are rubbish. We realize we can do better for our own health than the guidelines can. So why do we care about guidelines? And to take it even further, why am I the one talking about guidelines? I'm the cardiologist who said, I'm not impacting people the way I want. I didn't spend 14 years in college and med school and residency and fellowship, so I could sit across from a patient, type their information into a calculator, and decide whether to give them a drug. That's not the impact I wanted to have on people. That's why I wanted to break free outside of that, uh, that realm and get trained in functional medicine and nutrition and personal training and behavior change and start an online consulting so I could get outside of those guidelines to really impact people in the way that I wanted to. So of course, now that I say that out loud, I realize I just sort of gave you all permission to take a nap or check your email for the next 20 minutes while I talk about guidelines, but don't do it. All right, Siobhan, put your phone away. Don't do it yet because there's a method for my madness here. All right, chances are everybody in this room is going to have an experience with a guideline-based physician. Chances are you either have or you will. And most of the people I see in my health coaching program, they all have. So it's important for you to understand what these guidelines are, where that physician is coming from. And by knowing the latest updates, you even, may even be more informed than they are. But here's the second point. The guidelines this year actually give a glimmer of hope. This is the first time I've seen a glimmer of hope that the, the you know, the, the institutional-based guidelines are saying we can do better for assessing cardiovascular risk. We can do better than we have been doing, and I think that deserves pointing out. So I'm going to highlight three case studies that go through some of what I think are the important parts of the guidelines. So first, let's look at this one client of mine. Okay, that's not actually him. I wouldn't put his actual picture up, but this might as well be him, all right? He's He's clearly overweight, has metabolic syndrome, the big waist, prediabetes, hypertension, low HDL, high triglycerides, all right? This is not a good picture. Kind of a funny picture, but not really a good picture. He's pattern B on his LDL, which means he has, a, on average, his LDL or the smaller LDL, as we just heard. His, L, uh, his inflammation marker, CRP, is elevated, and he has tremendous insulin resistance. Look at that. Fasting glu glucose is elevated with a fasting insulin. So the HOMA IR, for those who aren't familiar with it, is basically a calculation of insulin resistance, and you want that less than one, and he's at 10. His calculated 10-year cardiovascular risk is 7.6%. All right, so let's see, how do we calculate that? Well, this is the risk calculator that we were all told in 2013 we need to use to decide what your risk is and decide if you need a drug, if you have a statin deficiency disorder. So what does this include? Well, it includes this age, gender, and race. Okay, we can't do a whole lot about that. But also blood pressure, your cholesterol, total HDL and LDL. So what's missing is triglycerides, lipoprotein little a, the size and density of your LDL, inflammatory markers, those are all missing. It includes diabetes, but it's as if diabetes is some binary diagnosis. You either have it or you don't. So if you had diabetes for 10 years, your A1C is 10, or you had diabetes for six months and your A1C is 6.7, you're the same on this calculator. So the calculator has a little fault to it. Same for smoking, um, and then if you're on any treatment. So you plug the client's information into this calculator, and we had 7.6%. So what do these guidelines say for the calculator? Well, if you're above 7.5%, you therefore benefit from a statin. Okay, that's the guideline-based care. In truth, it said you start the conversation about a statin, but they knew what that meant. They knew that was gonna mean prescriptions for statins flying out of the door. But if you unpack that a little bit further, and you see who's gonna really benefit from these statins, and you use the absolute risk reductions and the number needed to treat, you need to treat about 140 of these people for five years 
to prevent one heart attack. It's a different way to look at it. It's not quite as impressive for that person who has a 7.6% risk. Is that worth it? But here's where the 2018 guidelines really shine. They say we can do better than that. And we can do better by getting a coronary calcium score. So coronary calcium scores have finally seen the limelight, I guess you could say. It's a simple test for those who don't know about it. It's a, a CT scan of your chest, of your heart. It takes about 10 seconds to do. No IV, no IV contrast, low radiation dose. And it can give you a picture like this. Hopefully not this picture for anybody in this room because this is very high, dense calcification of the LAD. And we know the higher level of calcification, the higher the cardiovascular risk. So the guidelines finally say, if you're in that intermediate risk category, we can do better for estimating your risk, and this is one tool how to do it. And here's one study that shows why. I'll uh, zoom up on this. So this was from the Walter Reed Army facility, or military facility. They took people and followed them for 10 years for those who had calcium scores, looked at those who were put on statins and those who were not put on statins, and said, what's your cardiovascular outcomes after 10 years? And you can see there's supposed to be two lines here, one for the people on statins and one not on statins, but there was absolutely no difference if you had a calcium score of zero. So zero calcium score, this study showed no benefit whatsoever of taking statins. If you look at the people who had a calcium score between 1 and 100, they started to separate a tiny bit. But again, look at the number needed to treat. We would have to put 100 people on a statin for 10 years to prevent one heart attack. Not death, one heart attack. Then when you get into the higher numbers, greater than 100, so on the left there is from 101 to 400, and on the right is greater than 400, they're about the same statistically. Now the number needed to treat goes down to 12. Okay, so that's starting to sound a little more reasonable. The caveat, of course, being these people were on standard American diets, low-fat diets, they were not on low-carb diets, not represented in this trial, but the data is what the data is. So the guidelines, therefore, say if you're in this intermediate risk and you have a calcium score of zero, there is no drug benefit. If you have a calcium score between 1 and 100, then it requires further evaluation and follow-up. And if you're above 100, then the guidelines say statins are indicated. Now, also notice there's the percentage there, whether you're above or below the 75th percentile, and we're going to talk about that a little bit further. So with this one example of the patient that we saw, what did I do? Well, you can probably guess I didn't reach for my statin prescription. Instead, he went on a six-month of a lifestyle program, which included low-carb, high-fat. It also included exercise and stress management and sleep. So I can't stand up here and say, you know, nutrition did everything, but he lost weight. His waist size decreased. His blood pressure normalized. His LDLC went up a little bit, but so did his HDLs, triglycerides went down. He went from pattern B to the pattern A, sort of the more friendly pattern. His inflammatory markers came down, and look at that insulin resistance score from 10.4 down to 1.1. So now if you plug him into the cardiovascular risk calculator, you get 4.7. So take a look at this for a second. LDLC went up, but cardiovascular risk per their calculator went down. So LDLC does not tell the whole picture. Oh, and by the way, we got a calcium score, which was zero. So now that we have a calcium score, we can use the MESA risk calculator, the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis calculator, where he's down to 2.1%. So how is this calculator different? Well, still has gender, still has age, still has race and ethnicity, but now it has coronary artery calcification. All right? So now we can refine that risk better. And this point deserves a little emphasis, because in my experience, these guidelines look for excuses to prescribe medications. They are very drug-centric. This is one of the first examples I've seen with an update that says, now we have a bucket where you don't get a drug, and I think that's so important. So if you see a guideline-based doctor and you're in the intermediate risk and they reach for their statin prescription and say, hang on a second, I heard something about this test called a calcium score. Don't you think we should look into that? Because now it's in the guidelines. So that's one very good ray of hope from the new guidelines. All right. The second case is a 49-year-old Silicon Valley venture capitalist. Again, not him, but might as well be juggling 100 different things at once. He's active, he's fit, he's got good blood pressure, he eats a healthy, sad diet, lots of whole grains and fiber. I'm sure he's always very happy about that. And his LDL, not too bad. HDL and triglycerides, you know, could be better. He's already pattern A. His CRP is a little elevated. His HOMA IR is also a little elevated, so definitely has insulin resistant. But look at you, if you put him into that calculator, 2.9%. So doesn't benefit from a statin, 
But the worst part is, I think a lot of physicians would also say, 2.9%, you're good. You don't have to worry about anything. Keep doing what you're doing, despite the insulin resistance, despite the elevated triglycerides, because those aren't part of the calculator. He doesn't have diabetes. He's fine. Don't worry about it. That's where we can definitely do better, and the guidelines fall short. But it turns out he did have a calcium score. You know, venture capitalists, they get every test known to man, right? So they're all getting calcium scores, which is a good thing. More information is probably good. So he had a score of 23, which puts him in the 77th percentile. And when you put him in the MESA risk, he gets a 4.1% risk. So that percentile is important because a calcium score for a 49-year-old of 23 suggests a much different process than a calcium score of 23 for a 70-year-old. Right? Much different exposure during your lifetime. Well, what he did, the doctor wanted to put him on a statin because of that calcium score. He came to see me and we talked about things. And instead, after just three months, we saw some significant improvements. His HDL went up, his triglycerides came down, his LDL went up a little bit, but his CRP came down, his insulin resistance came down. We also checked a lipoprotein little a, which was great at 60. His 10-year risk reduced to 2.2% and his MESA risk down to 3.6%. So here's another part of the guidelines because now they say if you're in that 1 to 100 um, score of calcium, you deserve further evaluation. Perfect, per, uh, personally, I think we all deserve further evaluation, but according to the guidelines, do you have a premature family history of cardiovascular disease? He did not. Do you have metabolic syndrome? No. Chronic kidney disease, no. Chronic inflammatory conditions. So this is an important one because now there's this increasing rec recognition that lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's and um, inflammatory bowel, that they have this chronic inflammatory condition that can increase your cardiovascular risk. CRP came down to normal. Lipoprotein little a being an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, also important to check. In my opinion, important to check in everybody, not just in this one subset and elevated triglycerides. So again, the benefit of the guidelines is they're recognizing we can do better than the calculator. There are more things that encompass cardiovascular risk that are in the calculator. The downside to the guidelines is they sort of limit it to this one subset of the population where I think these should be used for everybody. All right, so the, the third example here is the hyper-responders, which I think a lot of people in this crowd know quite a bit about. So here's an example, 53-year-old triathlete who's been keto for two and a half years, LDLC is elevated, LDLP not even calculated because it's so high, HDL86, triglycerides, fantastic, pattern A, amazing insulin sensitivity with a HOMA IR of 0.5 and a great LP little a. So I ask you, what is her 10-year cardiovascular risk? Give me some guesses, what's her 10-year risk? I know I'm not hearing many guesses. All right, stop guessing, I'm just torturing you. Here's what the calculator said. This calculator only provides 10-year risk estimates for individuals with LDL less than 190. It won't even calculate it for you. The calculator says, I'm broken. I don't, I don't know. My algorithm doesn't work. It's only for people less than 190. So my response to that is this. He does it better than I do, but that's my response. And it's craziness, and here's why. Not all LDL greater than 190 is familial hypercholesterolemia. So why does this matter? Well, let's look at this. The studies that were used to make that recommendation of treating everybody with LDL above 190 with a statin, don't assess the risk, don't get calcium score, don't pass go, don't look any further. The studies used to get that information were studies done on people with either low-fat diets or standard American diets who had LDLs above 190. When you look at that population, a pretty significant percentage of them are going to have familial hypercholesterolemia. So unless the study screened for it and excluded those patients, that information is now invalid to a general population, let alone a low-carb, high-fat population. But even a general population, that is now invalid because you cannot assume that the LDL in a genetic condition where the LDL receptors aren't working, so that LDL is staying in circulation longer, giving it a longer time to interact with oxidized particles and become oxidized itself, longer time to get glycated, longer time to get retained in the vessel wall. You cannot assume that LDL has the same effect as an LDL in someone with perfectly functional LDL receptors. Those are two completely different pathophysiologies, yet the guidelines treat them as exactly the same. Now, in fairness, I can't say we have the data to say these hyper-responders on low-carb, high-fat, have absolutely nothing to worry about with elevated LDL, and their 20-year risk is as low as it can be. 
So Dave Feldman and Siobhan, hurry up and get that evidence for us. But in, until we have that evidence, it has to be on our radar screen that yes, this is a different pathophysiology, but also yes, we can do better than just prescribing a statin. We have to be aware of it. We have to be cautious of it. We can do more testing, more evaluation, more follow-up, but it is a completely different pathophysiology, so we should not have the knee-jerk reaction to prescribe statins in this population. So those are three examples of how these guidelines have improved, how there's some good, and how there's maybe not so good, and especially as it applies to low-carb, high-fat, because none of these studies looked at people with a low-carb, high-fat lifestyle. We are not represented in these studies. The evidence is what the evidence is, and we have to interpret it as best we can, apply it to ourselves as best we can, but it's not so clear-cut. So I want to leave you with a little story, all right? There was a time in my life when I really wanted to get better at golf. And trust me, it'll make sense in a second. But now with basically two jobs and a wife and two kids, golf is a sad afterthought. But there was a time when I wanted to be better at golf. And I was online reading every article, watching every video. I was w asking my friends what they were doing. I even saw my local golf pro who videoed my swing and put it next to Tiger Woods swing to show me everything I was doing wrong. But I wasn't making any progress. It wasn't until I saw the people at TPI, at Titleist Performance Institute, See, at TPI, they're not just experts in the golf swing. They're experts in biomechanics, in personal training, in physical therapy. They could evaluate my body, how my body worked, and design the swing for me. It didn't work anything like Tiger Woods' body, so I don't want his swing. But they found a swing that worked for me and could develop a training program to help me improve. And it was only by pulling on expertise in those multiple fields that they could do that. Well, I think everybody in this room and all the people I interact with on the coaching program, they want to improve their health. And they're online reading every article and watching every video. They're asking their friends and colleagues what they can do. They're seeing their local doctor getting the guideline-based approach. But if you really want to transform your health, if you really want to transform your life, sometimes you need to work with the expert who can pull from expertise in multiple different areas, who can talk to you about your lipids and your insulin and your blood sugar and your inflammation who's an expert in medicine and nutrition and exercise and lifestyle counseling. If you really want to improve your life and improve your health, that's what I wish for everyone in this audience, that you can work with somebody like that. Now, fortunately, there's probably a couple dozen of those people right here in this audience, and the numbers are growing. So I encourage you to seek out somebody like that because that's, those are the people who are going to be able to interpret these guidelines for you not for a knee-jerk reaction for a drug prescription, but interpret the guidelines for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>